brought to you by Riga Strand University in Riga, Latvia. <laughs> Welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. Mike, thank you so much for, for coming on the Protrusive Dental Podcast. This is a, a really cool new thing that we're trying. It was your idea and I, I, I was like, this is amazing. Let's give it a go. So for the first time, we are sort of recording together. So thank you so much for... I'm excited to be here. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And uh, one, one thing that um, uh, if my wife ever looks through my phone and looks through our, throughout our chats... Uh, and sees uh, us talking about uh, webcams and how excited I am, then I I'm actually glad that there's going to be <laughs> it's going to be released so she can see what <laughs> she can see what it's about. So yeah, Miguel, thank you so much. Um, I I knew about you because your presence on uh, Ripe is is amazing. That's I think that's how, how, how I think I learned about you. Uh, and then when I saw that you were doing a program in Stockholm. I, I, I jumped at the, the chance to see you and that was such a key learning experience for me in my journey with occlusion, which is something I'm very passionate about. So I wanted to talk about Stockholm and I just wanted to um, help the, my, my listeners to learn about a few key concepts uh, about occlusion. So that's what we'll talk about. So St Stockholm, um, wow, two days intense of Stockholm with you. That was amazing. That was a really, really good time. You know, Johan Hagman is always such a great host. And we had people from, I think, eight or nine different countries. It, it was it wasn't a it wasn't a program. It was a study club. It was a get together. It was a gathering of friends. And it was great to have you there as well. Thanks so much. And uh, what, what, what I liked is that Pasquale was there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Nigeria was there and you presented the, the prize to her, which I thought was a very nice touch. Uh, but, but, you know, that was very, very sweet, actually. So that was, yeah, you're right. It was, it was more than just a, a, a program. That was something special. So, so, so I just want to dive right in in terms of uh, learning points. So one of the things that, um, you know, I came away with a, a better understanding of is face bows and articulators. Sure. That's what, you know, as a, as a, a, out of dental school, I really had very little idea. I mean, yes, we got shown how to use one. But really to apply it, it didn't make sense to me. So if I, I, I'm sure it's a question you get asked all the time. So for our listeners, what's the point of a face bow? And are articulators really all that? Are they, when are they needed? When do you need to use this? Well, it, it's just a tool. It's like anything else we use in dentistry. It's like, wait, when do you need to use a carver? When do you need to use a mirror? We can talk about all the specific applications, but... Any, anything in occlusion or anything in our dental instrumentarium is to help us accomplish a goal, and it should be to help us achieve that goal more efficiently. So we want predictability and practicality out of anything. So before I answer about face bows, I'll tell you, I use triple trays all the time, and I know that shocks people. You know, I, I teach occlusion all over the world. I've been editor of the Equilibration Society, but it's not about being a dentor, better dentist by using a face bow. A face bow helps relate it with some somewhat accuracy the hinge axis to the maxillary cast. Why is that important? Because it can help us have relative uh, accuracy for opening and closing motion on an articulator and relative accuracy for motion on an articulator. But whether we're using an articulator or whether we're using a triple tray, what we really want to balance is how much time does it take to use the instrumentation, that is the face bow, the articulator, the protrusive record, versus how much time does it take to just take a triple tray impression? Then you have, but then you have to balance either of those with the adjustments that are needed in the mouth. Because if you're just doing a single simple crown, and you take all the time to take a take a face bow, you take all the time to take upper and lower full impressions, and you take the time to take a protrusive record, is that really saving you anything when you have a single crown, you have conformative occlusion that matches the adjacent cusp slopes? So for me, both of them have a place in my practice. Absolutely. And you know, there, will be, there will be some listeners out there who, who don't know what a triple tray is. Uh, essentially, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I use them as well. And um, it's basically a three in one, hence why it's called triple tray. It, it will get the upper uh, impression, the low impression and, and the bite together. Uh, and a yes. lot of dentists, as you know, Mike, uh, and it's great that you know, you know, we're talking about this. A lot of dentists are against triple trays because they think it's like it's so um, it deviates so far away from the traditional 
teachings of, you know, articulate her face. So just like you were saying, and to be fair, I completely agree with you. I think uh, in a, you know, in a canine guided dentition where there's already so much disclusion and they're just conforming and it's just a single crown, I think, you know, that's probably what laboratories are receiving the most of nowadays. They are. It's in, in the United States, it's above 95%. Wow. It, you know, it, it gets into like this religious cult thing about always use this or always use that. And when you're saying always, you're pretty much never right. Is It's what we need to get the job done. And let's just talk about why we need occlusion. We need occlusion so we can walk into the operatory with confidence that we'll be able to do our job well. We need occlusion so that we can walk out of our operatory knowing what we did is going to last and then that we did it efficiently. And the other thing that occlusion builds isn't teeth. It builds your reputation. Because if you're fumbling and stumbling around and things are taking a long time and things are taking a lot of adjustments, patients can lose their faith in you. Now, if those restorations that you made, regardless of what how you made them or what materials, if they break, then patients can really lose their trust in you and your reputation can be damaged. So when, we, when I think about occlusion, I... I know we like to jump into all the face bows and all the all the all the discussions of articulators, but honestly, no one needs occlusion. What we what occlusion offers is is the component that fits in between all the other components. We have communication. What does the patient want? We have treatment planning. How can we get there? And occlusion is really what makes it fit. Because if you look at treatment. The planning 101 is how do you want something to look? How do you make it fit? Occlusion is what gets us there and helps things last, regardless of whether you use a triple tray, regardless of whether you use a face bow or an articulator. It's all just about dots and lines. It's all about distribution of load and reduction, reduction of forces and shear that help our restorations last longer. I definitely took that away from your program. And also you mentioned about communication with patients and that was an element of surprise for when I came on your program that actually you, you covered so many gems about communication uh, which I took away with me so when a patient says something like um, sensitivity and then they're, they're very brief about it I do your technique I sit down and I say tell me about sensitivity or tell me about this and there's a few other gems that you gave away that day, just a few ways to, to make patients feel comfortable and, and to be a good listener and a good history taker was, was also really key. But the, the other thing that you um, talked about is why, when we come out of dental school, why is it that occlusion is perhaps very poorly taught or our understanding of occlusion coming out of dental school is, is, is uh, not as good as it could be? It's a good question, and, and it's it, it's a hard one to face uh, because you know I I, I've, I I lecture in schools, I've taught in residency programs, and I've of course been a been a dental student. The reason that occlusion occlusion can be taught, occlusion is not appreciated in dental school education, and the reason is is we're missing one key element in our education, and that's failure. Is occlusion, as I said, is a solution to help us meet a goal. And that goal is longevity. And that goal is success because we don't want things to break. We start in school and we start seeing patients maybe the end of second year, in some schools, the end of third year. And all you have to really do is make it through one patient each half day for the next 18 months and you will have restorative and geographic success because you will be out of there and we won't see our things failing. But when I was in dental school and we had paper charts, I mean, some of these paper charts were this thick. And if you look back at them, there was failure after failure after failure. And, you know, why these patients were in these schools and in these programs so long is because what we were doing was not necessarily working as far as longevity. The only thing we remember from occlusion in dental school is probably, like you said, canine guidance. Why? Because it was the answer on an exam. Canine guidance, as far as us providing any restorative care in dental school, all it was was a tick mark and a check mark on the criteria we needed to pass that restoration or pass that written exam. It didn't really benefit us when we were in dental school because we never saw the benefit of it because, like I said, we never saw the failure. So the reason we can't learn or rather appreciate occlusion in dental school is because we don't see things fail. 
when we get out of dental school and we start getting into bigger cases or anterior cases and we start getting into all porcelain restorations, that's when we see things fail and that's when people are drawn to occlusion as a need rather than a requirement that they had to take in school. And I remember I won the DVD when I was in Stockholm because I, I got the answer right that yes, it was failure. Because you asked that question, what's the one thing we don't you know experience? Uh, so that, that, that was awesome. Uh, so the next thing I want to know, and I'm sure you get this uh, answers all the time, and something I get asked as well, because I've been to a few lectures from the different schools of thought, so you know where I'm going here now, is someone says to you, okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm a, a recent graduate. Uh, should I do Dawson? Should I do Panky? Should I do Koish? Should I do Spear? Should I go neuromuscular LVI? Uh, what, do, what do I do, Mike? You know, so what would your answer be to, to a, a dentist who wants to um, sort of delve deeper into occlusion? And there's a lot of these sort of pathways out there. Uh, uh, and obviously you're very seasoned in a lot of these um, schools of thoughts as well. Do they really differ that much? Is one really better than the other? And what's your recommendation? If you take my class, I'll say, this may be your first occlusion lecture. This may be your next, but just don't let it be your last. I've studied with every single one of those programs that you've talked that you that you mentioned and i learned something from all of them I, I think if i could give a piece of advice is don't religiously get pigeonholed into campy arguments between uh, teaching institutes because all of them have something strong to offer and all of them have their weaknesses i've been uh, a visiting faculty at spear education with frank dr frank spear i'm currently visiting faculty at the Pank Institute. I've taught at uh, PAC Live back in the day when I was in California, and I have and currently have my own uh, occlusion education programs. That being said, I still go out to other teaching institutes. I still attend lectures by other people. I bring all that up to help avoid <laughs> help avoid some uh, occlusion wars, because you've seen that on any of the di discussion threads. There will be people <clears throat> that are from polar opposite camps that can get along. And then there are people that are from two different teaching institutes that have incredible similarities in philosophy, but they battle like cats and dogs. And that's the thing that's probably the most unhealthy in our, in our profession is unprofessional disagreement and lack of respect for other people with opposing viewpoints. So... If you ask me, and people ask me this all the time, I say, which institute should I start off with? I ask them what they're looking for, because all of the institutes are excellent, but they all have a slightly different approach. So it would depend on, on what that person asked me and where I would recommend that they go. Cool. Thanks so much. Um, the other thing which uh, I always um, think about is something that you taught me, which is, Aesthetics, function, structure, biology, okay? Uh, but you, 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 may, you raised a really good point that actually when we're designing inclusions, who, in, this is something that I, I put my own thought into this as well, that when we look at natural dentitions, we rarely see the perfect occlusion, i.e. the textbook uh, type occlusion, right? And then when we're designing or rehabilitating these, uh, these you know, worn and um, destroyed occlusions, and we're really rebuilding them, and we rehabil re rehabilitate them into this perfect textbook occlusion. And are we doing that because we're, we're, we're trying to restore their function? But no, you, you taught me that actually it's aesthetics, parafunction, structure, biology. So for our listeners, can you just explain that theory? Because that was a real light bulb moment for me. Thank, well, thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad that was helpful. And that's a lesson I, I passed along. So aesthetics, function, structure, biology was actually a breakthrough viewpoint that was shared with me by one of my uh, good mentors, uh, Dr. Frank Spear, is looking at that aesthetics. How do you want it to look function? How do you want to make it fit structure? What needs to support that and biology? what is uh, any of the disease processes that we need to address. The way that I've done a little play on words or switched what, what Frank or Dr. Spear has taught me is, is I say aesthetics parafunction because I don't believe that teeth wear much from chewing and I know other, other uh, practitioners do and other lecturers do and that's fine. What I care about is longevity. 
that's the same thing they care about. The etiology of breakdown for me is structural. So when do things break down? When teeth come together. We can argue about whether they come together when people chew or when they grind their teeth. Based on my experience of 25 years and based on the research that I've done in grinding patterns, I think that parafunction is the highest threat that we really need to mitigate. And now, I was laughing a little bit while you were talking because you said two things. You said perfect and ideal and textbook. And the only thing about textbook is taking an exam and I, like we laughed about it based on dead white guys in Scotland because that's where all the anatomical studies were done at the University of Edinburgh through grave robbing and some darker, darker arts of obtaining bodies. But if you go with a cookie cutter approach, you're only going to succeed when you're making cookies. And that is everything that we're taught about occlusion and uh, occlusal design and parafunctional control is really based on a class one occlusion, canine rise, transition, a crossover. So what I like to share in my programs is while I'll go over that and I'll go over the class one is I really want my participants and my attendees to understand the why. Because if you only know the how, when the how doesn't come along and fit that cookie cutter, you're, you're screwed. Yeah, excuse my language, but you are. And we don't need a cookie cutter, we need a bakery. Because sometimes things still come in in class three, some things they'll come in class three edge to edge or past to edge to edge, or they'll come in class two div one where you can't start or you will even struggle to achieve any kind of anterior guidance, certainly on the centrals, and it may even take a while to get to the canines. So what I think we need is a better understanding of how we can adjust and adapt regardless of the occlusal scheme. So for me, an ideal occlusion, if there is one, would be one that can distribute forces as best as they can and reduce resistance as best as they can with the goal for both of those to be longevity of the restorations. Amazing, and, and the take home point for me is when we're designing the occlusion, actually we're not designing them to chew and function, we're designing them to resist their para function. Uh, and that was just a, it's a beautiful, simple way to, to re um, uh, change the way I thought about it. So that was great. Uh, one last thing uh, to, 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 to talk about for uh, we talk about your upcoming program is, can you hear these fireworks? Late Diwali? <laughs> Actually, it's it's it's, it's a birth. Uh, it, it marks the sort of um, uh, the birth of Guru Nanak Devji, which was um, uh, the, the first, the founder of the Sikh religion. Uh, and I, and I live in the equiv equivalent of Little India, so so that, that's what that was. But anyway, so uh, one thing I want to speak about before we talk about your upcoming program is um, splint therapy. My gosh, people are so confused about splints. It's one of the most controversial topics. It gets a lot of uh, questions uh, when anytime anyone posts on, on social media about splints. And there are, like all parts of dentistry and occlusion as well, there are very polarizing views. And we can go into the whole anterior midpoint stop appliances and uh, those who are really against it and whatnot. But, but one thing I want to uh, uh, just talk to you about is that, uh, or tell you, is that your DASA, so dual arch, anterior midpoint stop line protocols that you showed were was amazing uh, and and uh, the way the cases that you showed and the application of of confirming con uh, confirming centric relation prior to rehabilitation and you talked about the different indications that was great and i've been using that in, 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 you know in a lot of my patients and it's been a, a real game changer for me so um i'm glad, glad you've had success with that i'm using that all the time in practice uh you know in the right indications and, and seeing great success with it so can you tell us uh, just you know briefly to anyone who's not familiar with these sort of appliances is why uh, you think they um have a, a place in, in 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 practice is that too broad <laughs> No, but I would actually probably even want to make it broader, is why would you use any appliance to begin with? And that's where I always want to start. I always want to start with the why. We get into arguments, as you say, and we get into disagreements because people have their what and their how, and they want everybody to do their same how. Like, you have to do my how. You have to use my how. My appliance is the right one. My, my, this, this, this. But... In so many of those discussions, we're missing the why. 
So why do we use orthotics? Why do we use occlusal splints? Why do we use bite guards, night guards, whatever you want to call them? There are just a few very simple reasons why we use them. We use them to get people out of pain. We get use them to help protect things, and we use them to help figure things out. Palliative, protective, diagnostic. So if someone is hurting, and they could be hurting in their teeth, they could be hurting in their muscle, or they can be hurting in their joint, they need a palliative splint. I don't care what design it is. If someone is breaking their teeth or breaking their restorations, and they want to keep those restorations intact, then they need a protective splint. Now, if we need to figure something out, whether it's in other camps that want to figure out chewing patterns, or my approach if we want to figure out parafunctional patterns, or if it is important a joint position, then it is a diagnostic approach. And you can use full arch appliances for all of those applications, and you can use anterior midpoint stops for all of those applications. It goes back to the exact same thing that we were talking about at the beginning of this uh, chat, is we have a lot of tools, but we have to have goals, and then we have to balance efficiency with them. The reason that I personally like anterior midpoint stop appliances, or as you you said, the, the DASA splint that I shared with you, the dual arch anterior scribe or stop appliance, is that when we only hit plastic to plastic in the front, there are no teeth touching. So if you want to protect teeth and you have no teeth touching, the teeth get protected. Now, if we have pain or if we have muscle pain, and we want to knock that muscle pain down, when we only hit at the midline, the temporalis and masseter are knocked down by 70% to 30% muscle activity. Less muscle activity can mean less muscle pain. Now, in the third application, if you're looking to get the joint to seat and the joint is not seated, and you only have a midpoint stop appliance, then once those muscles are, have their activity knocked down and there's no plastic in the, in the back and in the way for the, of the uh, condyle to seat, then the condyle can seat. So when I look at an anterior midpoint stop appliance or the DASA appliance, I look at it as efficient. Now, of course, after that, everybody's going to scream, anterior open bite, anterior open bite. Well, you know what? If your condyle seats, you're going to, you have the potential to get an anterior open bite. So if you we, our profession, was using CR appliances all these years. Where are all the anterior open bites? So there are ways to prevent anterior open bites. If you want the condyle to seat and you have a severe wear case, that can be a good thing. But say you just want to protect the teeth or say you just want to have palliative care of the muscles, there are adjunctive appliances that we can use to help maintain MIP or maximum intercuspation position. And th that appliance is in the in the states at least is called an AM aligner, and it doesn't come from CR dentistry. It actually comes from sleep apnea or sleep medicine. So in sleep medicine, when we were repositioning or are repositioning mandibles forward so we can keep an airway open so people don't die, what we were able to figure out or what they were able to figure out is before we started the anterior. Uh, repositioning splint, what we did was we took a wafer bite in MIP, and then they wear their, their, their nighttime appliance. Then when they take their nighttime appliance out, they put that wafer in, they could relearn or they could maintain MIP so that they didn't develop posterior open bites. We can use that same approach to help avoid anterior uh, open bites when we're only doing a protective or palliative approach and don't want any occlusal changes. I know I just I know I just uh, went on blathering for a few minutes, but you you obviously hit on one of my my passionate points. Mike, in the last three minutes, I don't I don't know how long you spoke for. You've literally done such a fantastic summary of splints. Uh, so th that's amazing. Thank you. And for anyone in the UK listening, uh, I have found the supplier for AM aligners uh, in the you know. Oh great! Discuss that and, and share that as well. Uh, so yes, you know that's a, a very. Uh, 
a, a unique part of your your program that I learned about these AM aligners and the dancers, which have been a, a great staple appliance. So thank you so so much for that. So I think that's all we've got uh, the time for today. Otherwise, we could be speaking forever about this. This has been. I have to tell you, Jazz. This has been a really really lovely chat. I've uh, I've had I've had fun with uh, you know just chatting with you, talking with you, discussing, bringing up thoughts. But uh, I love the format as well. Thank you so much. And uh, obviously, uh, we want to talk about your uh, upcoming uh, event now. Uh, so, Occlusion in 2020, uh, 29th and 30th of May. Okay. You'll be coming to uh, Heathrow, London, to the Sheraton Skyline Hotel. Um, what is your program about? Program in Heathrow, Occlusion in 2020, Occlusion in Everyday Practice, the 29th and 30th. What I'm going to do and what I'm going to aim to do is take the attendees uh, on a journey from one tooth dentistry all the way up to full mouth rehabilitation. I wanna blend, blend theory and practicality. And if you've heard one consistent theme in our discussion, it's understanding the why and not regurgitating the how or the what. I want people to understand not just how to do something, but why they're doing it. Because when you understand the why, you can flex from one tooth dentistry to two tooth dentistry, to arches, to quadrants, to full mouth. So if you're if you're a practitioner right now doing single tooth dentistry and kind of nervous about jumping up to two tooth or three tooth or quadrant dentistry, we're going to have something for you. If you're already doing that quadrant dentistry and you aspire to do you know arch or even full mouth, we're going to have something for you too. And and based on my past experience of doing this program for for a couple of decades all over the world having new practitioners and advanced practitioners and specialists, we're going to have something for you to take home as well because it is be a better dentist the day after this program in some way, shape, or form. I know we're going to have a great time. We're going to be going over lots of cases that blend in the theory with reality and how it happens in everyday private practice. Uh, and uh, there, there's a restaurant uh, at that hotel. It's called Madhu's. Oh, this is the important part. I knew you'd like this. Okay, so uh, it's called Madhu's and it has the best, most tender, most succulent lamb chops you've ever had. Mm. Uh, well, now now I'm there. I'm signing up. <laughs> Great, Miguel. Thank you so much. And uh, it's really uh, always a pleasure talking about occlusion with you. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in, in uh, London in May 2020. We'll see you there. Thanks for inviting me.